This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter. At Pepe Sayer, we focus on quality. So if someone comes into your restaurant and they see you're using Pepe Sayer, they know immediately that that is a quality product you've got in front of you on the table. And that comes from a decade of just doing quality butter day after day. For more information, go to pepisayer.com.au. I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nation people as the traditional custodians of the land, and for this episode in particular, the Wadandi people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. You know, you want to go to work smiling every day and have people like, feeling the same and that's when you really succeed, when people are happy in what they do and, and have a, a purpose and a, a goal, you know, which is, which is lovely. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Julian Langworthy is Chief Winemaker and General Manager of Deepwoods Estate in Margaret River. He is one of Australia's most reputable new wave winemakers and leads a huge team of skilled workers to achieve great heights in internationally acclaimed wines. Hi, Julian. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you, Shanta. It's, you say such lovely things about me. It's semi-true, but um, I'm very flattered all the same. <laughs> oh, I've been told I talk a lot of crap too, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, no, I've caught... no, no, I'm backing you up on that one. <laughs> Thanks. I've caught you today on our side of the continent. Are you in town for trade? Are you in Sydney for work or, or pleasure? Yes, um, Sydney. Well, Sydney's always pleasurable to visit, but... Um, it's trade largely this week. I've just had an appointment at Fred's in um, Paddington and um, I didn't have enough time to get back to my hotel before um, chatting to you. So I'm just in a corner booth. I've got a glass of um, Daniel Defoe Shabley in front of me and, um, and yeah, it's so very, very um, suitable, you know, I'm pretty happy. So there's a bit of background noise, I apologise, but, you know, it's all ambience. Absolutely, and I'm just so glad that you have something to drink. I was my next question was, what is Fred's giving you to drink? So you've already answered that. I love that. Now you were born in Margaret River, and your father worked um, in vineyards as well. Is that where your kind of journey in wine all began for you? Yeah, I guess I look. I always loved wine, and my dad um, is an ornithologist, and he did a lot of research into what the the bird pressure we had in Margaret River, which was pretty disastrous for a lot of the early vineyards, and so he worked the ag department, and that's why my family moved to Margaret River. Um, and look, I guess I was always interested in wine, um, but you, sometimes you take a bit of a longer road, you know, like when I first went to university, I, um, I loved surfing, I loved fishing, I loved diving, and I did marine biology. Um, but the reality of marine biology, like, you know, mapping um, sea slugs on the sw- floor of the Swan River was less glamorous than I envisaged. And um, I managed to fail most of marine biology. And um, yeah, ultimately it sound, seemed fair on the fishes if I found another occupation and, and winemaking um, was the perfect foil. Incredible. I think also too, I mean, if you're still interested in in the ocean, you know, you're in a perfect spot in Margs to get out and, I don't know, do a bit of diving and, and still be amongst, you know, something that you love, which is obviously the ocean. Do you still dive? Are you still interested in, in that kind of, you know, occupation? Uh, a- absolutely. Um, it is a beautiful place in that regard. I do lots of fishing. Um, I've got a, a 10-year-old son, Harry, who's uh, fishing and diving mad, so we do lots of it. It's great. It's really it really is a release and, and you know we're so lucky you sort of touched on it before Mud River is an amazing area and the coastline is just some of the most remarkable in the whole planet so yeah still do lots of that much better um, pastime than a primary occupation for me perhaps though do you do you ever remember a time of uh, you know um, you know your father talking about time in the vineyards and and talking about diseases and things like that do you do you remember that you know as a as a young person kind of thinking what's he going on about yeah the well my i think my parents in the 70s and early 80s in Margaret were fair fair kind of hippies and i think my dad's job was pretty cool actually um so my mum was a school teacher at the local at Margaret primary school and um before i could go to school i used to go to work with dad um, and he did a lot of like trapping of like birds that were, you know, eating the vines and stuff. And my, some of my earliest memories are like rattling around in his um, blue Suzuki um, that he had uh, around vineyards like Cullen and Mosswood and Cape Mantel. 
for wherever he was doing his research. And um, I, I remember going to the beach quite a bit and eating Count Choculars at, um, at a place called Gracetown. Um, so it seemed like his job was pretty cool. And um, yeah, and, uh, I remember it so clearly. Like I, I really did grow up between the barns. Oh, sounds gorgeous. You went uh, overseas and, and did some work in France and Canada. What did you learn from those countries when you were over there? Um, oh, look, you learn um, stuff with whatever you do. Um, I learned a lot in France. Um, oh, I guess uh, probably about life and and um, and different people's aspects and different ways of going about things. I guess I don't know if it was as formative as some of my Australian experiences as a younger winemaker. But what I definitely learned was, you know a lot about myself and how to get the most out of things and how to make the best out of situations and stuff like that. I did um, uh, work with some amazing people and make some great contacts, which also really helps. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And hopefully you've you've stayed in touch with them from that time as well. I want to talk a little bit about your work with the legendary Sue Hodder at Winds in Coonawarra, one of my heroes. What did you learn about Cabernet in the Coonawarra and, and what was it wor- like working alongside Sue? Oh, well, Sue's actually one of my heroes as well. Um, she's an amazing lady and um, she gave me a huge amount of responsibility as a very young winemaker at Winds. She gave me um, some amazing brands, to, well, amazing products, I guess, to call my own and, and be responsible for and, and sort of taught me and amazing about about management you know like you get the most out of people when you entrust in them and empower them and all you then need to do is sit back and support them while they you know pour their effort into it and which is pretty much what Sue did with me and I learned so much about winemaking but probably even more about um, managing people in a, in a great way which is which is one of the like absolute core strengths and on top of that, she's just an absolutely lovely lady that does um, does great things. And um, 30 years on, still at wins, making those wonderful wines. Man, I've had some of the wines from like those late 60s that like stop you in your tracks and you just, you've got no words, no, you know, bullshit descriptors that you can pull out because it, they're just so phenomenal that you just kind of, yeah, left absolutely speechless. They're pretty amazing. Yeah, one of one of my best ever wine experiences was um, like you know because the wines in the museum there at Winds underneath the Gable Building have been there since they were bottled and like they're the most beautifully preserved, wonderful wines. And um, we had a magnum of sixty five Winds Black Label Cabernet, which was just as vibrant and as fresh as as drawing breath. It was an, just an amazing eye opening wine. I've had been very privileged in my time at Winds. Um, I did learn a huge amount about. Um, older Australian wines and Cabernets, things like Ovens Valley Burgundies from the 50s and 60s, um, Wynn's wines from the 50s and 60s, even Penfold's wines um, from that era in that cellar were, were pretty absolutely amazing. And um, yeah, to, to be able to try them with people that knew, you know, the history in, intimately would have made it even more special. Oh, sounds amazing. I wish I could be a fly on the wall. You joined the Fogarty Group um I believe in 2011 with Deepwoods Estate. No, by no means is that a t- small appointment. That's a huge position. Run me through what that day was like and how it came about. Well, um, the Fogarty Wine Group um, was much smaller back then. It's been a it's been a pretty huge um, sort of um, bell curve of, of growth and learning and things like that. Um, it was kind of. It was coming home for me, um, and Deepwoods at that stage was quite a little winery. Um, and Peter Fogarty, the owner and CEO of the Fogarty Wine Group, kind of said, well, here's, here's winery, you know, make delicious wine and, you know, just do it, do it really well. And that was kind of about it. Um, so it was kind of perfect. It was, a, it was sort of like, you know, I was 31, I guess. Um, I had all these ideas, all this ambition to, to make the world's greatest wines in Marga River and then all of a sudden I had my winery to do sort of what I will with it and the resources I needed to kind of succeed and that's what we've tried to do at Deepwoods for the last 11 years is to make the world's best wines and um, you know I think we're getting there and, and we've been really successful on the way and we've had a lot of fun and, and it's, it was the right job at the right time for the right person. I was a little bit concerned when I first started coming from corporate winemaking from the Treasury and after that I was a head winemaker at Napstein and Lion Nathan. I was a little bit concerned I'd be bored but um, I haven't had a bored day yet in 11 and a half years so um, 
yeah, I don't think I'm going to get one in, in any time soon either. I can imagine why not because, I mean, 11 years is kind of crazy if you think about I, – I can't imagine Deep Woods being a small winery, thinking about the labels that you have now and the access to fruit and what you're in charge of. So, in 11 years, it's gone kind of through the roof, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been a pretty crazy, crazy trajectory. Uh, you know, my first vintage of Deep Woods Harmony Rosé, we made 250 dozen. Uh, we made 20,000 dozen of that wine last year. That is crazy. With that kind of projection of, of over time, you must really need a lot of great people underneath you to, to, to kind of cope with how big it's grown. How many people, how many different winemakers do you work with? Um, in the Greater FWG group, um, between Tasmania, New South Wales, Victoria and WA, I think we've got 12 or 13 winemakers. Um, at Deep Woods, I've got um, myself and two others, um, Andy and Emma. They're absolute superstars, you know, like I wouldn't be able to do anything like it. All wines are part of the whole team. And I think that's been one of the things that made Deep Woods really strong, you know, like we're all on a common journey, shooting towards common goals. And, and every cog in that in that wheel is as important as any other from the cellar hands that are carrying out the instructions. Um, I, you understand what we're trying to achieve and hence are carrying out the cellar instructions to the nth degree to the guys that are doing fruit thinning in the vineyard like they're all all the percentages that go together to make great wine so they're absolutely integral and, and it's a great part of winemaking is getting to work with other great people and and also people from around the world that just come in for like maybe a three month period of harvest you know yeah and thank god we can kind of have them back now and we can <laughs> you know, uh, welcome them in. I mean, when I first met you, I did think that you seem like somebody that would get along with so many people. And it's interesting to hear you talk about what Sue taught you in that time and, and management of people, because there's a lot of jobs out there where you, you know, learn the skills in terms of what, what is needed, but the people management and the, the everyday function of working with different personalities is often not taught. And it can be kind of the make or break of a good company, can't it? Oh, uh, look, you're a hundred percent correct. And, um, you know, like, uh, I think, that was a nice thing about coming from a, um, a corporate company and coming into a family-owned business. Like some of the corporate companies do some really good training and stuff in terms of stuff that you know if you're going to manage and run a wine winery that you probably need. And some people are just good at those things. But I was pretty lucky to get some um, you know things like media training and conflict resolution training and all this kind of crap, which sounds ridiculous at the time. But you, you do get some skills that, that help you and. And at its core, I really like working with people and working in a team. And so that goes together nicely to try and, um, you know, build great teams and, and great culture. Because, uh, you know, without that, you know, you want to go to work smiling every day and have people like feeling the same. And that's when you really succeed, when people are happy in what they do and, and have a, a purpose and a, a goal, you know, which is which is lovely. So, yeah, no, Sue, Sue is integral on that. And, and I think... Um, my coming to Deep Woods with good training from some of those other roles I had prior was also quite integral in that. Definitely. And you're right, there's not really a way, like you said, when you do some of that corporate management training of people, there's not really a way to put it that doesn't sound like absolute crap because when you're learning it, you think, God, this feels so perfunctory and unreal. And then you can actually go, actually... That's actually really useful. I can put that in place. <laughs> but when you're learning it, you think, God, what a crap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, my God, am I really doing this? And like, um, But it's funny. Like, even, it's like anything, you know. Like, when, even if you just garner a couple of things from that kind of stuff, like, and that resonate with you, well, they resonate with you for a reason. And then and then you can, you know, you can manage and turn them over into, into your day job and your real life. And, and that's kind of enough, you know, like just some diamonds in the rough just to help you on your own journey, you know. Absolutely. In 2016, you won the Jimmy Watson Trophy for the 2014 Deep Woods uh, Reserve Cab. I have to say, some of the most outstanding Cabernets I've tasted in like the last eight years have been made under your leadership. What's the secret to great Cabernet from Margs? And I also want to ask, if you're not drinking Margaret River Cabernet, what other regions do you really enjoy drinking Cabernet from in Australia? Okay. Um, well, um, my favourite regions in Australia uh, for Cabernet are probably the Yarra Valley, Coonawarra and Margaret River. 
Um, Yarra makes lovely medium body, delicious wines in, in good seasons. Kunawara is just so archetypically Australian and um, and ageable and worthy and great value. I still I love, really love Kunawara and then Margaret River for me is 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 key and and king. I think what makes um, great Cabernet, um, especially for us in Margaret River, is the uh, amazing weather we get in March and April. Like it takes about a month for the final ripening stage to sort of happen um, in Margaret River, and it's it's a beautiful slow process. Like I've described wine making in Margaret River like falling off a Venus log in the past. You know, like it it really is the most wonderful benign climate you know like in sort of april every day at deep woods is 25 degrees and every night it's 15 degrees and it's the sun's out and the rat ca- cabinet ripening is slow and linear and what you're looking for is ultimate tannin ripeness in my book and when you get ultimate tannin ripeness everything else in that vineyard is harmonious the flavors make sense the tannin structure makes sense the acid makes sense the structure makes sense you know and in my group we're really lucky because the ripening isn't forced so we don't get too much sugar accumulation in that period and hence the the whilst we can wait for that beautiful tannin ripeness we don't have overly alcoholic wines because they're overripe you know so it really is the the superpower of the region it's just it's just pretty amazing and are you checking on on the ripeness of tannins just going by taste or are you testing a lot or are you just you know checking on you know checking through the vineyards by taste it's just the vibe your honor um it's it's taste it's the vine habit it's where it's at it's the the turgid nature of the berry it's it's everything you know like it's the real you know we do the only thing you can really control for me as a winemaker um you can look you can't put the grapes back on the vine you know so when you crystallize that moment of picking that's the destiny sealed for those grapes and all you can do is maximize it from that point you can't make them any better you know the, the phrase you know you can't polish a turd you know no, no matter how good a winemaker you are and how clever you think you are and what gear you've got, if you've got shit to work with, you'll end up with shit wine, you know? Like, all we're trying to do is maximise that potential. And that moment of crystalline picking is where you, like, define so much about the wine, you know? It's pretty exciting. It's where I lose a lot of my sleep each year is um, making picking decisions with Cabernet and Chardonnay and Margaret River. Yeah, because you also have a lot of balls in the air at one time, right? You're not just looking at, you know, one little block of wine. So I can imagine <laughs> trying to balance all that is pretty stressful. Oh, 100%. It's, um, it's pretty crazy. Um, the, the very, my absolute favourites, I get lots of love and attention. Um, my Deep Woods Block 3. Look, by the time we get to Cabernet, it's a bit quieter. The most hectic time for me um, is Chardonnay. <laughs> Chardonnay mm-hmm. picking windows are quite small. Um, you know, I think the difference between great Chardonnay and okay Chardonnay is as little as two days from you getting your picking day right. So... Um, Cabernet, it's a bit slower, it's a bit longer, it's a bit more stylistic in decision rather than just pure quality. Um, and um, so it's a little bit more relaxed by then. But yeah, when, when Chardonnay's coming in and we're new staff and barrels being delivered and all that sort of stuff, that, that's massively hectic and like, quite stressful. Yeah, and then figuring out where, where all the parcels are going to go and what vessels they're going to go into. Yeah, I can definitely see I don't envy you at that time of the year, that's for sure. <laughs> the flip side is, though, it's really exciting as well. You know, so the greatest thing about being a winemaker is every year is different. Every year you're doing something different. Like the, you want to call, you talk, we talk about Tawa, you know, I talk about the vibe, you know, every part of it is part of the vibe, you know, the people, everything. And every year you're trying to make the best wine you've ever made. You're not trying to make something similar to last year, you know, we have house style. But every year I want to make it the best it's ever been and the best in the world. And that's just exciting, you know. Like So whilst it's pretty intense and stuff, like, I think when that vintage period ceases to be exciting and it ceases to be like a new dawn of new opportunity, I think I probably, um, I've done my dash in the industry, but I, I have never felt that way. And it's and it, to this day, it's super exciting, super compelling, super, super, super awesome. Yeah, I can imagine it being pretty exciting and no year is exactly the same, which always keeps you on your toes. I want to ask you about Nocturne, which is your own label with your wife, Alana, single vineyard wines. How do you approach 
you know, uh, your own label and, and, and the freedom that you have with your own label. I know that we, we poured your Nocturne Nebbiolo Rosé for quite some time when we reopened Key and, you know, it was amazing. But uh, unfortunately, I think everything's on allocation these days, so it's done very well. Um, t- talk me through that label. Uh, Nocturne's kind of a, a passion project, if you like. Um, we bought a vineyard um, in Margaret River in about 2015 um, called She Oak, and... Um, just the, the idea with Nocturne was to, like, I love Chardonnay, love Cabernet, love Rosé, and was just to make these three wines, right? Um, the best single site Chardonnay we could find, the best single site Cabernet we could find, which was this vineyard, Shirk, that we bought, and the best kind of cool, um, structural, cerebral Rosé we could, we could do. So the idea was just to make um, you know uncompromising epic kind of wines that were sort of unique and spoke strongly of a place um, and also strongly of a sort of a wine making ideal so um, yeah that was kind of it and we sort of partnered with um, Sellerhand who are a great distribution company and we just wanted to like make super cool wines that people sort of really loved and resonated with and it's been an amazing journey the love for nocturne label has been huge and you're right it's all allocated these days um, we only make quite small amounts it really is just a side passion project um of you know super cool proportions but yeah it, it's 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 uh, it's the uh, the interest the fun it's it's pretty cool and it's lovely to have this vineyard chio um, going from you know from grape to all the way to glass and seeing that evolve and and unfold it's quite a you know proud parent moment you know <laughs> definitely dev with your favorite child for sure if you think about your year at a glance what's one part of the year that you really look forward to or something that you just love doing and what's something that you just dread every year I dread um, allocation every year not so much so at the end of vintage and in May, we, um, we do, we taste all the wines, give them grades and allocate them to products, right? Um, but that's fine. I quite enjoy that. But then what happens as part of that is we have to um, account for, um, well, I, I spend two weeks being an accountant or helping, at least helping the company accountants understand all the crazy wine making shit that we do. I hate that. The numbers never add up. It's the worst. Um, and probably my favourite part of the year is, you know, realistically, it's when you're seeing those first grapes come in and vintage, you know, like exciting new beginnings and, like, and you know, the, the process all starting again and the energy that's in the winery, um, the excitement that's around the place, um, you know, that that is, from a winemaking point of view, absolutely awesome. My other favourite part of the year is um, Boxing Day because I don't do anything at all. I just watch cricket all day and drink beer. <laughs> That's exactly how it should be. You know, feet on the couch, yeah, beer in hand. <laughs> no, no, one, no one bothers me on Boxing Day. Perfect. And that's a warning to everybody who is considering sending you a message, by the way. <laughs> uh, I want to know if there's someone else making wine in Australia or, or a br- another brand, is there anybody out there that you, you drink their wines time and time again and think, shit, they're doing such a good job and I really, really enjoy drinking their wines? Uh, well, the, the godfather of uh, McLaren Vale, Stephen Panel um, wines are always compelling. I love, I love them. I think they're just great and interesting, cool, best Grenache. It's so nice, um, and that's and that's one that I buy domestically quite often. Um, I also love Wendery. Um, it's probably you know more about a vineyard and a and a. And a and a brand statement and a, and an unwavering epicness but I always love it when the Wendery wines arrive each year that I buy um, they're really cool um, there's so many there's like all sorts of exciting stuff going on um, you know, I, like the, I like the stuff that Broken Wood are doing currently up in the Hunter um, I really love the stuff that Sarah Crow does at Yarra Yearing in, in Victoria um, uh, the Pooleys Justin and Anna um, Bub um, are doing great stuff down in Tassie um my mate Charlie Seppel over in um, oh, Peter Dredge in Tassie as well. They're really cool wines. There's so much cool contemporary epic wine getting around in Australia at the moment. It's um, it's a feast for the senses, really, and um, and we're pretty lucky. And and these wines are these they're like they're they're cheap in the world scale, you know. Um, and we're so fortunate to have such great wines to discover around the country. There's so much diversity and soul and and 
love put into them. It's pretty exciting times in the Australian wine industry for that regard. It's so true. And you you are 100% right when you say, when you talk about the cost of the wines. I know sometimes, you know, when you look at your hip pocket, you think, oh, that's that's pretty expensive. But if you look, go out looking for quality in the rest of the world for those prices, yeah, we are so incredibly lucky. Oh, you've, you've absolutely nailed it there. Like, you, uh, I'm a white burgundy tragic right um but from a value point of view you just can't justify buying them but uh, they're so expensive now and there's such great australian sound they out there which is is comparable in quality and so much more consistent and such better value yeah definitely and and you're right it's, it's fine when you're spending someone else's money but when you're spending your own it's it's yeah you really have to talk yourself over the line uh, i was thinking about you and thinking i wonder what he does drink because i was like actually i don't think we've ever discussed that and I was like, I have absolutely no idea. So I'll ask you what, what you are drinking uh, at home. But if you could, if you had to nail it down to three drinks, which I know is super cruel, three beverages for the rest of, <laughs> three beverages for the rest of your life, what would they be and why? I, th- I know you don't mind. I've heard you say a Cooper's Green. Would that be in the top three? Yeah, um, especially off the front bar at the Exeter Hotel in Adelaide. Um, that just seems to taste 100% correct there. Don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, I don't know, something right. Um, my watershed moment with Chardonnay came with um, a Magnum of 1998 Bonnet de Matre, Corton Charlemagne. Um, and I'd drink that wine for the rest of my life if I could. I can't afford it anymore. I couldn't really afford it then, but um, it really changed my changed my whole um, perspective on, on Chardonnay and the great white wines of the world. So that was pretty exciting. Um, have I got one more choice? Um, well, it's uh, got to be Cabernet. So I've got beer covered. I got white wine covered. You know, I'd be I'd be pretty happy to drink Deep Woods Reserve Cabernet for the rest of my life. It it, it holds that dearer place in my heart. You know, like it's a vineyard that just has so much personality and and it's sort of we've grown up together. So it would be I couldn't desert it at any juncture. So that would be pretty cool. Uh, I have to yeah, I, I totally agree. Amazing, incredible wine that's just got. Oh, amazing on release, but I'd really like to see some of those wines. Uh, some of the Deep Woods stuff put aside, you know, for a rainy day in terms of the, the cellar. You have to um, come and have dinner at my place. But um, <laughs> uh, we, we had the 14 last night at dinner um, at a event I did at Nomad in Sydney. Um, it was looking beautiful. But they age really gracefully and beautifully. Um, I like... I like them in that sort of mid-range age, sort of like you know, sort of six, seven years bottle age. They still got the exuberance and the and the the joy of youth, but they got those layers of complexity and fineness coming in in waves and really, really adding to the overall drinking experience. is pretty cool. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, I'll keep that in mind for the next purchase, and uh, I do hope that I get to to visit you over there at some point. I really appreciate you making the time. Julian, I know how busy you are and I know you're about to jump on a plane tomorrow. So thank you so much. And I hope we get to do some more judging soon because I could pick pick your brain for ages. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, it was a pleasure to meet you in Brisbane and congratulations on your impending first baby. And you must be super excited and I'm excited for you. So look forward to the next time we get to catch up. Can't wait. Thank you, Julian. I really appreciate it. Cheers to you. Absolute pleasure. Cheers. Talk to you later. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Stay tuned for more stories from the world of wine and drinks. Listen in every Thursday on your podcast app. Follow us on Instagram at overaglasspod and contact us at overaglass at deepintheweeds.com.au.